Hello, everyone. Troy Eckert here with Eckert Enterprises in Allen, Texas. I have a really, really unique guest today. Um, I am honored to introduce Dr. Al Haji, and um, he is an individual that I've been looking at and reviewing his expertise across the board when it comes to global and macro oil and gas and energy and overall market conditions. And I, I reached out and said, hey, look, um, if you have the ability and the time, I'd be honored to have you come on and talk with me because that's all we focus on is U.S. oil and gas, but it's really a global market. So, uh, doctor, thank you so much for joining me today. And if you might give a little background on yourself, because you have a very storied career. And thank I think you. it's something that really sets you apart from others as far as credible information based on great education. Uh, thank you very much. I, I got my undergrad in, uh, uh, in Saudi Arabia. And uh, when I was talking to to the chairman of the department, I told him I want to study petroleum, uh, anything related to the petroleum business. And he said, uh, give me a couple of days. This guy, by the way, the chairman of this department became extremely famous uh, later on in life. And he was kind of like the godfather to me. Uh, and he said, give me a couple of days. And after a couple of days, he came back with a list of the top five universities in the field. And the University of Oklahoma was the number one. Of course, at that time, the, the they fluctuated between number one and four. Uh, but at that time, it was number one. And I told him, I want to go for number one. And he just looked at me. He said, well, if they accept you, you'll be lucky. And uh, I ended up uh, finishing my master's and PhD at the University of Oklahoma, Very Norman, good. Oklahoma, uh, and uh, started from there. Uh, went to Colorado School of Mines, one of the best engineering schools in the world, uh, where I taught for a few years. Uh, there, I then went to Ohio, taught in Ohio. Uh, then I uh, got hired by NGP Energy Capital Management, probably you already know them, uh, as ch their chief economist. Very nice. I stayed there for several years. Of course, they were the, the premier private equity when it comes to oil and gas, etc. So that was uh, an amazing uh, experience, especially the the being exposed to. Uh, shale and all the individual smaller companies, which is, as you know, is a completely different world uh, from the oil majors. Uh, yes. Completely different world. Yes. Uh, so that was a great experience. And then uh, uh, left in 2016, and I started on my own w wearing several hats, and I still wear several hats. And one of the things we've done, which is, uh, I, I think, it's just an amazing product, uh, which is establishing the only energy focused media outlet in Arabic. I mean, wow. with all the massive uh, energy resources they have, I mean, we talk about oil and gas in particular, now solar, uh, th there, there is not a single media outlet for this. So we started this and uh, I am the editorial advisor to this group. They have 32 employees with 21 journalists. And uh, that's another another thing that uh, the amount of learning I learned from this experience was just amazing. And mm -hmm. I got exposed to I, I've been with the media since 1991, but I got to expose to the media in a completely different way where um, I was able to figure out things and how uh, the media play their games in mm -hmm. a way that I would have never been able to do so without this product. Wow. And, you know, that's that's played in every market and every industry and politics, and you name it, where the message being told is maybe not the truth or at least is not the full truth. And so uh, it's like everything else in life. If you were understand the intricacies of what the motive is, the direction and the agenda, it sure changes the facts because the facts are facts. But the presentation, you know, that's kind of what I've said my whole career. You know, I've, I've dealt with uh, high net worth investors who specifically want to own oil and gas assets in their portfolios. And I try to tell them, you know, just because you hear it on Routers or Bloomberg or Fox News or any kind of journal, World Oil, anything else, it's skewed. It's skewed for the audience. It's skewed for the advertisers. It doesn't really necessarily portray what's happening. And I also felt like oil and gas, which is why I was so uh, glad to hear your presentation about three weeks ago, was it's it's not what's happening today. It's like watching the ball. You got to know where the ball's going 
not where it's at today. And I think too many people are worried about what the markets are doing right now at this moment. That's that's the least of our concern. It's about where we'll be in 36 months, 72 months, or in a decade, because it is rapidly changing. It is it is a bigger, bigger market. Um, let me ask you a couple of questions. So you've got a, what, a 30 plus year career. Um, I started in 85. We're pretty much about the same age. Can you just tell me what you think has been the most dramatic change in fossil fuel, oil and gas in, in your career? What's been the most change? Is it technology? Is it is it the demand? Is it is it is it the different economic pushes and pulls? What what do you think has been the number one significant change you've seen? I think one issue that people always ignore is that the energy industry is so technically advanced that people do not realize how much they are technically advanced. I mean, they, they always think about like sending a rocket to the moon is technically advanced. Okay, but they don't know that drilling in uh, uh, like one mile of water, uh, uh, drilling two miles under the ocean in a one mile of water is one of the most technically advanced things in the world. Yeah. Okay, and to control uh, a whole platform uh, that is 150 miles away uh, in the ocean from a room in Houston uh, before anyone even realizes that these things can be controlled. So the, the advances, the te technical advances in the oil industry are beyond imagination. Uh, so that's number one. But the share revolution literally changed everything. Like literally everything I was teaching uh, like in the early 2000s, changed completely now, completely changed. And you cannot go back to the old books or the old papers and teach from them. The share revolution changed everything, flipped all the trends upside down. And the fact is we call it revolution because it flipped everything upside down. Right. And literally flipped all the trends. So the trends been going up, now they are going down and the, the trends been going down, they are going up. So it is a true revolution by every sense. Uh, so those two, two observations about the oil industry throughout those years. Do, do you find that um, when you talk about the revolution, you know, one of the things I've noticed is that, and I started off in the 1980s where, you know, is the typical rig hand, you had slipping logs, it was 2D seismic. I mean, by today's standards, people would just absolutely laugh. You, you drilled a well doing what? Yeah, it was, it was, Unbelievable. And so I I got the opportunity of seeing directional drilling early on in the late 1980s and 1990s, where we were drilling horizontally in one of the uh, the basins, which is the Austin Chalk. And people are like, well, the horizontal drilling is brand new. I go, no, no, directional drilling has been around a while, but you never had the tools, the technology, the computers, the hardware, the software. You never had the ability to understand what you're doing. We were just kind of like putting our hand in a black bag and feeling around, seeing if it worked. Um when I think about the most dramatic change for me, a guy that's out drilling wells, representing investors that are participating, you're right. It was the shell revolution. But here was from a monetary perspective, here was the biggest change. We used to go in and look at a prospect. I shot a bunch of 3D seismic back in the 90s, and we'd have four or five companies in a project. And we'd say, hey, we shot seismic. We found nine tier one locations to drill vertically. We think we ought to drill prospect number one. It's got the highest probably probability, we'd say, well, what is the probability the data is right? Is the seismic correct? What's the size of the reservoir? How much is the dry hole cost versus the completion? So we were analyzing based on risk. And then when shale started really heavy in 2010, I noticed there wasn't any geologists left in the room. And I noticed we weren't talking about dry hole versus good well. We were talking about rate of return in declines, starting in IP rates. We were talking about EURs in the ground. And all of a sudden I'm going, so we're not talking about whether we have a good well or a bad well. We're talking about do we have a good well or a great well. Are we talking about do we have duplicity of activity? We're talking about capturing reserves. It completely went from, I think, from an expiration, true expiration terminology to now we're harvesting and how much can you harvest? Um, and I think that from a from a pure a guy on the street looking at spending capital, that was the most dramatic change. I wasn't having to think about dry holes. I was thinking about what's the best use of my money? Where do I get the best rate of return? Um, when you think about what you said, technology being advanced, how do you think artificial intelligence is going to change us going forward? Because I, I think it's got a big impact for us. 
Well, one of the issues, as you know, and you've been there long enough to realize that uh, the human resources are not going to be there in the future. Uh, simply for two reasons. First of all, when, when young people look at the potential for employment and layoffs, etc., the industry, as you know, uh, with every downturn, they let a lot of people go. And a lot of people got burned. So that's number one. Number two, we have all those climate change agendas basically are brainwashing those students and shying away from studying petroleum engineering or geology or anything related to it. And we've seen several departments at various universities, especially in the United States, very basically being closed. So the industry have no choice but to go toward literally robots, uh, AI, and other things. So regardless of the advancement of AI technology, the industry was going in that direction even before most people heard about AI. Yeah. Simply because these problems with the human resources. And the industry, by the way, did... I mean, if we got to evaluate the industry, the industry have done, uh, despite everything good on, on one side, they've done a lot of bad things. For example, they, instead of looking at their human resources as a big wealth that I need to keep and do things, they just get rid of them on the spot. Yep. That's, that's not a good way to bring them back. That was a big mistake. The way they promoted the industry, and, and I always kind of wonder why they've done this. If you really want to create a nonprofit organization to promote the oil and gas industry, you create it and promote that in California. You do it in Boulder, Colorado. You don't send them to South Texas or West Texas to educate people about oil. It's a complete nonsense. If you look at all those organizations, whether in Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Colorado, they are operating or literally they are preaching to the choir. Yeah, I, I that, agree. Th that's that was a waste of money. Now I understand why they've done that because they want to lease from individuals and they want to convince the individuals basically to lease. So they thought they can. But that's a completely different approach. If you really want to do it, so where they lost? Probably some people, some of your viewers will hear this for the first time. You know when you talk about uh, uh, soccer, the, the European or Middle Eastern or Latin American football, not the American football. Uh, FIFA, the organization that kind of oversees the whole thing, a long time ago, they found out that the, the soccer is declining. Really? So they hired a public relations firm. And there is this smart guy. I don't know who he is or what, but they, they just come up with this crazy idea. They said, if you want really to gain ground, you need to go back and start from first grade. Forget about the adults, forget about the teenagers. Yeah, right. You start from first grade. And they started. But 30 years later, all of a sudden, all the young Americans who never been, or their parents never been exposed to soccer, all of them are playing soccer. Right. And all of a sudden, girls basically are playing soccer, which is unheard of in, in, even in Europe. And now the, uh, the, the female soccer team, the American team basically, is winning all those things around the world because they grew up with it. Yes. Okay. That's the approach that the oil industry should take. Forget about creating those nonprofit organizations, talking to people your age, my age, and, and the adults in the room. They don't need to talk to that because what climate change and others, does, especially the extremists, what they did, they did exactly what the FIFA did with soccer. They went to the first grader and they grew up with them. All of a sudden, now we are graduating uh, students who are against their parents who are working for the oil industry. Right. Okay. So if they want really to promote the oil industry, they should forget about all those efforts they are doing now. They need to go back to the first graders and grow up with them. And that's the only way they can win. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a great point because, you know, that's what the cigarette companies did back 50 years ago. They said they got kids smoking at seven or eight years old. They knew they had them for life, right? And. And I will tell you, I'm, I'm firsthand experience. So when I started, my older stepbrother was running an investment company, ended up being a drilling superintendent. And I was always the youngest guy in the room. I was 25, 26 years old with my own company. And I was like a kid, right? Now I go to meetings, I'm 60. I just turned 60. And now I'm like the oldest guy in the room. And the drop from me to the next generation is maybe 15 or 20 years. So my average staff around here out of 58 employees, 
my senior executive team and my uh, technical team, geologists, 35 years old on average. So there's a huge gap. Highly skilled, well-educated, lots and lots of knowledge about the technology. But you take a guy that's 60 years old, he walks on a, a drilling superintendent, walks on a rig, he can hear something click, he can smell a gas, he knows exactly what to do. You can't transfer that expertise and, and what you said is true. My brother went through every five years being fired, laid down a rig, unemployed. He's like, do I should I do something else? And nobody wants to build a career like that. And what they end up telling their kids is don't do only gas, do anything but only gas. It's a rough career. So you're right. If we don't go back and reinvest, um, I think that's going to be a, a real downfall. And, and quite frankly, that's why I keep believing that we are we're going to see a escalation in commodity prices over the next decade for multiple reasons, including capital constraints, liquidity, but also intellectual downturn. We don't have any bodies. We have no people left, which is very difficult. Um, so let me ask you this. When you think about the last three or four years, now we've had an administration change from Trump to Biden administration. Who knows what's going to happen in November? And we take a look at, I mean, the radical price all the way through COVID, through the start of the Russian war, where we're at today. I mean, my analysis has been we should be a lot higher in oil prices than we are. Probably not over 100, but it sure seems like we've taken this almost carrying a weight and chain, dragging us lower on commodity prices than we should be. Now, that's my personal assessment, but I believe you have a different take on that. And you kind of explain that in your video because of all the access to oil. But I'd love to hear what your thoughts are about where we're at in commodity prices relative to where we might be without all this extra stimulus and liquidity that was pumped in the economy. It is important for people to realize that the economics of natural resources is completely different from the regular economics of the industrial production. Uh, it's completely different. And when you talk, and oil, of course, is one of the natural resources, natural gas is, coal is, copper is, and everything else. The issue here is your cost upfront is extremely high. And like you said earlier, you might end up with a dry hole, the money, the hole, dry hole. The money is gone. Refilling the hole is not going to bring your money back. Right. So the money is gone. But if you get oil or gas, your operating cost is very small relative to what you spent up front. Yes. And therefore, as you go through the, the price cycle or the business cycle, even when prices drop substantially, you continue producing. Yes. Because all you got to do is just cover your operational costs or what we call the variable cost right. to survive. And that's where one of the problems we have in the industry is that where people will say, well, they are operating at loss. Yes, they are operating at loss. And they can operate at loss for, for a long time. But that's the nature of the industry. Because once you start producing, there is no way you can stop. And the, that's why... For the last 140 years, if you look at the industry, we always needed a manager to manage the industry. Yeah. Whether it was John Rockefeller, the Accessory Road Commission, the government, or the Seven Sisters, uh, the federal government again du during the 70s with the price controls and everything else, a letter with OPEC. We always needed some manager to solve those problems because of the nature of the industry. Yeah. So that's the problem we have. And people forget this. People think if prices should drop, then supply should drop immediately. Well, it doesn't drop immediately. And it will take time for supply to drop. And therefore, there will be many victims along the road. Yeah. And, and that's why people do not give enough credit to the Saudis or to OPEC, etc. Because they don't realize that without them, that we, we literally will move like from negative prices to, to 150 and back to $10 and back to 80 and then back to 150. So at least they can manage the extreme volatility in this case. And as you know, just this is just to be clear that the negative prices that we got on April 20th, 2020 has nothing to do with anything else except uh, contracts ending and there was a problem with it and that it had nothing to do with uh, uh, market management at all. Uh, but the whole idea here, it is the nature of the industry, and that's why it needs a manager to do that. So if you look at the last three, four years, OPEC, as you know, being, or OPEC Plus, being cutting production, they cut over 5 million barrels a day. And 
there is a general mistake in the media there and being promoted by some journalists that look this is OPEC cut is a total failure because prices did not go up no uh, if you bring back those five million prices would be in the 30s yes so you got to compare the 30 to the 80 and yeah. that's 50 is the OPEC impact so you yeah. don't say well they failed no they did not fail it's like, just like looking at the cup it's half empty or half full it's exactly the same the same concept so and if you look go back to the beginning of the cuts basically it was very clear just to prevent prices from from declining although OPEC ministers do not like to talk about prices at all uh, they talk about market management and here I would like to mention something probably will surprise some people when OPEC was established in 1960 officially established in September 1960 in Baghdad five countries five Middle Eastern countries and Venezuela basically uh, four Middle Eastern countries and Venezuela establish OPEC what people do not know that the first OPEC announcement was made in Taylor, Texas in mm -hmm. May 1960 uh, to the cheers of independent producers in Texas. Wow. Okay. Wow. And so that's number one. Number two, those who established OPEC, there are two geniuses, by the way, they are true philosophers. Uh, one of them is uh, Saudi called Abdullah Torehi, and the other one is uh, Venezuelan minister is Alfonso Pires. And if you listen to them and go back to their writings or what they said in Taylor, Texas, was amazing. Because the first thing they said was, our job as oil producers is to stop and end our dependence on oil. Hmm. Interesting. We want to end that. By doing what? By selling that oil and taking the money and developing our countries. And we take that money and invest in something else. And then we reduce our dependence on oil. And then the second question, which is the most important and the subject of what I want to talk about, that they said, OK, but to get that oil and sell it in the market, we are not going to sell it at any price. So what we are going to do is we will always match our supply to whatever demand in the market, because that will give us the best price. Right. What does that mean is that price could be $10. Could be 20, could be 200. So the issue of matching supply to demand does not mean an increase in prices. It just means that I'm going to get the best price out of what is in the market today. Yeah. It does not mean an increase in price. So the, the main objective was I'm going to match supply all the time to whatever demand in the market, regardless of the price, because that will guarantee me the best price I can get from the market until I get rid of this oil and switch to something else. I, I think that makes me ask a couple of questions, though. So for one, you know, and this is, again, not having the expertise you do on, on macro Middle Eastern oil and, and Saudi oil. I mean, I've been doing this 40 years, but for me, it was always a function of two or three things. One, what does Saudi Arabia, OPEC, and global producers, what price level do they need to satisfy their own internal economics? Because they're basically... Uh, their oil companies are owned by the, the country. They're, owned, they're, they're sovereign, right? U.S. is an independent oil and gas company, a country for producing. So we, we are basically controlled by supply and demand and monetary profit and losses. So when you look at their break-even compared to our break-even, is there a push-pull that is in line? Or is it Saudi says, we can afford to cut back 5 million barrels a day because we don't need $90 oil. We can live on $70 oil with less production, but at least it's stable. Whereas the U.S., I, I think the U.S. break-even is, is a lot higher than 39 or 40, which people have been saying the last four or five years. I think with all the ancillary costs, insurance, diesel, employment, staffing, I think break-even is probably closer to $50 a barrel in the U.S. today. But what were your thoughts about that? Uh, how much time do we have? <laughs> pl 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 plenty of time, as long as you don't get bored with me. <laughs> okay. Um Let's let's go back into history, and then I will answer this question directly. Uh, a few months ago in April, someone uh, made a video, and they talked about Saudis ending the petrodollar, and oil will not be priced in dollar. Probably you've seen that. I saw it, and it was a complete nonsense. Complete nonsense. The information is is not correct, but um, it did gain a very large number of viewers. Mm -hmm. 
then other YouTubers, when they show this video gaining a lot of attention, everyone followed. Right. And later on, it moved to Twitter. So those Twitter accounts with like the big accounts on Twitter, they start writing about it without knowing what they are talking about. Right. And they've been posting some pictures of documents, et cetera, et cetera. They did not even read those documents, did not know what's in them, and it was a joke, literally a joke. And there is, just to be clear on this, there is no agreement between the United States and Saudi Arabia on pricing oil in dollars. There is none. Okay. And there is no 50-year agreement in anything. There's, there is not a single agreement on anything, anything that's 50 years. Uh, most of the agreements that Saudi signed with the United States are five-year renewable. But there is no 50 years. So the whole thing, uh, someone came up with it. But the whole idea here is there was a meeting between Prince Fahd, who became king later on, uh, at the White House with the President of the United States on June 6, 1974. That's after the embargo. And he brought in a massive group of from various walks of life, businessmen, etc., to do deals with the United States. And they did make plenty of deals and many contracts, mostly related to defense, education, training, etc., economics, all, all kind of things. So there were agreements, but none of them included the idea of pricing oil in dollars into the system. Right. Some one of the documents that people uh, posted as evidence of the petrodollar and the link to pricing was the minutes of the meeting at the White House. But whatever they posted, even on YouTube, you cannot read a single word out of it. But they just show you the title, and you think that's the document. Mm -hmm. Well, I have all those documents, and I have a copy of all the contracts and all this stuff, and I can tell you this. The, uh, the, that document from the White House basically was the meeting minutes. I like your country. I like your uh, leadership. I know your role, etc. You guys are doing very well and welcome to the United States. And oh, we would like you to visit Saudi Arabia. It's a, that, that's what's in it. There was one statement from the president of the United States at that time that was extremely important in this meeting. He did ask the Saudis to increase production. So mm. The Saudis were cutting production. Right. And that's bring us to the issue of Pakistan. The Saudis, after the floating of the dollar in 1971, oil was already priced in dollars, right. already being traded in dollars. But the Saudis look at their revenues and they saw their revenues in real terms going down because the dollar value was going down. And all other OPEC members basically were panicking. So they met, they conducted several studies, they hired people to study this, and they have several studies on how we are going to price oil. And they looked at every alternative possible. And after they studied all of this, the conclusion was there was no alternative to the dollar. Because any other currency has the same problems with the dollar. Yes. So you talk about Japanese yen or the, at that time, the Dutch mark or the sterling or anything. They have the same problem. Now, they looked at basket of currencies. It does not work. It does not work because the dollar takes a big portion of it because the dollar is dominant in world trade. So you come back to the dollar again. But at the same time, you cannot agree on the basket because you have a country like Indonesia that is that has trade with Japan, like 50% of its trade with Japan, while Venezuela, 50% of its trade with the United States. So if you end up with a basket, one country is going to benefit, the other one is going to lose. So right. they cannot even agree on it. They looked at gold. Well, gold, you don't have enough liquidity in the market, basically, to talk about gold to cover the oil right. market. Oil is the largest traded commodity on earth. And they looked at the IMF SDR, special drawing rights. They were leaning toward it. We do have other things that being priced in SDR. But here is the problem. SDR is an imaginary thing on paper. Now you want to cash it. You are going to cash it for dollars. Yes, right. So anyway, you look at it, it did not work out. So everyone knew there was no substitute for the dollar. It had the liquidity, it had the reputation, it had the credibility, and it's the more stable than other currencies despite all the issues. Right. So the United States was aware of that. 
So why you 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 bargain for a card that's worth nothing? Yeah. Because the Saudis, I can give you defense, I can give you this, so you can price all. That's nonsense, right? But here's the nonsense of the whole argument about pricing oil in dollar and uh, the United States will defend Saudi Arabia, etc. Here is the nonsense of it. In 1974, all the oil in Saudi Arabia was controlled by Aramco, and Aramco was an American company, which is mostly now, after all the mergers and acquisitions, Chevron and Exxon. Right. And they are the one who take that Saudi oil and market that in the market, in the oil and in, in the global oil market. So they are the one who get the revenues. So if the Americans are getting the revenues, why go to the Saudis to ask them to price their oil in dollar while you, it's your oil? It's already being done anyway. So, so it does not make any, any sense at all. And at the same time, the, the American boy in the region was the Shah of Iran. Iran had the largest population in the region. It had the largest market in the region. It had the largest army in the region. So why don't go to the Shah and tell him to price oil in the dollar? You go to a small country like Saudi Arabia with a population of 5 million and tell them, please price your oil in dollar. They had the same production, by the way, in the early 70s, the same level of production. So the whole argument basically does not make any sense. And here is the final one. The Saudi real is pegged to the dollar. Yeah. So why MBS basically will shoot himself in the foot by saying, I don't want the dollar, I'm going to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Okay. Makes so sense. the whole argument was fake. Just the whole the whole thing was was fake. But to go back to the main to the main point, we talk about petrodollar. So the president of the United States asked the Saudis to increase production, and the Saudis replied something along this line: so, "Okay, I don't need the money. Mm. Okay, I already have enough for my. I have primitive economy. I don't have capacity to invest. Okay." And if I invest outside, the dollar is declining, real interest rate is zero, and you guys are confiscating the hell out of everyone because everyone you don't like, you are confiscating their assets. And there was massive uh, confiscation, by the way, in the 70s. You yes. go back and read about it. So I said, why I have to produce more to lose money? Yeah, right. So what was the reply from the US was very simple. He said, what about this? You are worried about a guaranteed real income that cannot be confiscated so here is the deal you buy our treasuries we guarantee real income and by law it cannot be confiscated interesting so go ahead and increase your production and invest your money with me you get real returns and that's guaranteed and safe so that's the agreement between the Saudis and the Americans. It's not about pricing oil in dollar. In a sense, you can look at it as it's indirect way to maintain the pricing of oil in dollar. Is that is that what's taking place today when they do their cuts today? They're saying we have enough money coming in from the current level of supply. We don't need any more money, so we're going to produce what we need. It does stabilize the price. We can produce less by making the kind of money we want. But, it, but what you just described is their constant goal is, is to match supply with demand and the dollar value will fluctuate according to that supply and demand, Correct. right? But the final, the final point I would like to make here for your audience is the following. Uh, the, the videos that came out about the petrodollar are mostly from gold traders and crypto traders. Yeah, right. Who were trying to inflate the issue that the dollar is going to collapse and therefore move to gold. To gold and, and, and they are missing the whole point because... Based on everything I said in the last 10 minutes, the substitute for petrodollars is not gold. The substitute for petrodollars is not other currency. The substitute for petrodollars is not crypto or Bitcoin. The substitute is oil underground. Yeah, reserves. That's what it is. And they are missing the whole, the whole point. So what are your thoughts about, you know, Saudi in today's market? You know, what I get asked by my partners and investors all the time is, What's the break even? When, when do you get a market that is too low where it, it becomes de minimis in terms of redeploying capital, drilling more wells, expanding your infrastructure? Sure. So um, the whole, it, the whole it, introduction it, I made, yeah. the whole introduction to reach this point, and I'm glad you brought it up again. The idea that the Saudis will cut production to reach a certain number in the budget is a complete nonsense. Okay. Okay. 
the IMF comes up with those numbers and then uh, someone like uh, mostly Bloomberg will come up with this and make a big story out of it, but it's about nothing. Right. They, in the budget, whether Saudi Arabia or others, they use an oil price to estimate revenues, mm -hmm. not to estimate the price that balances the budget. Mm. Okay, they come up with all the estimates and say, okay, here are my revenues. You could have a budget deficit in billions of dollars. And, and Saudi Arabia ran a budget deficit, by the way, for 21 years straight. Mm. Okay, why did it not cut production basically to balance the budget? Okay, yeah. so, so the whole argument here basically is nonsense. There is a price that's been estimated to finance the revenues, not to balance the budget. Yeah. And that price is completely independent of the oil policy. Okay. That's the finance guys, they use that. It's completely independent of that. And we've done studies before, some of it is published in refereed journal, by the way, on this. And we found out basically, there is no relationship between the price they use in the budget and the budget balance, none. Mm -hmm. There were two countries we found out, they follow this approach, and we found out there's two countries, and I'm going to give you the names right now, and you can find out immediately why. Iran and Libya. Yeah. Why? Because they have sanctions, and therefore they cannot invest overseas. Their money will be confiscated, and therefore they will produce only what they need. So right. if oil prices go up, they cut production because they have nowhere to take the money. Right. So only in the data that we collected over 30 years, only those two countries fit because of the sanctions. None of other OPEC members basically fit this. So there is no relationship between balancing the budget and the oil markets. When you think about the U.S., which is privately held, you know, that's the big. Uh, so we our company and our investing partners, we own, I don't know, 850 million dollars worth of oil and gas mineral rights in the Permian and the Anadarko. And one of the big drivers for us is always looking at the different oil operators that operate the minerals that we have acquired. And we're always going, well, what do we think the break even is? Because um, the big discussion, and I, I don't know if you're at that same level, but the big discussion in our group is what is a tier one geological acres position versus maybe a tier two? And so I've got a, a pretty stud geologist on staff and I get to argue with him all the time. And I said, you know, you're 34. You're super smart. You used to be with a big major. We hired you. But is the tier one today, was it tier one two years ago? goes, no. Yeah, two years ago, you didn't count those reserves. You didn't count eight, 10 wells per location. You thought it was tier two, but the drilling's improved. The technology's improved. The results have improved. The fracking's improved. Now, something you didn't give any kind of a value is now a tier one. And then that argument has a lot to do with the break even, because I'm saying if I know my break even as an operator is $40 a barrel, in oil drops to 65, by the time I knock out ancillary costs, cost of capital, maybe royalty income, what's my profit margins? And then how do I redeploy that? So it's a big factor here, at least in the US, I think, from what is that number or what is that spread that says we're going to have this continuation of drilling? I mean, we're now down to 580 drilling rigs, but yet we see daily supply going up. That just means we've gotten more efficient, faster, we're better at what we do using less equipment and getting more production. So let me you, explain. What, yeah. Let me explain this point, because one of the issues, uh, everything you mentioned is correct, but notice that the discount rate is involved in every item you mentioned. Okay. Right? The And discount rate basically is based on the time horizon. Right. So if you are operating in shale, for example, your time horizon is very short. If you are operating in conventional, basically a little bit longer, but as a company, as an individual, your time horizon basically remains short. When you look at the national oil companies like Saudi Aramco or Adnoc or KPC or uh, the, the uh, Bedeveza or other Bedeveza, the old days, of course, not now, uh, PMX, et cetera, you look at the national oil companies, you are talking about countries, and countries have a completely different time horizons from the private sector. Yep. Therefore, the discount rate used is completely different. Mm -hmm. And because the discount rate is different, the whole economics, the way they look at it, is different from the individuals. Right. So that's number one. Number two, one of the issues, if you look at countries with large reserves, that whether we like it or not, 
Now, as you know, you've been long enough in the business to know that every time we drill for oil, we get water. Yeah, right. And it's very easy to separate oil from water. Yep. But it's impossible to separate oil from politics. <laughs> I like that. And when you look at a country like Saudi Arabia, even if they want to isolate politics completely from their oil decisions, the other side will not isolate politics. Yeah. So politics is inserted anyway. And to give you some examples, let's say if there are some issues right now, okay, we have the, the possible war in Lebanon and we have the war in Gaza, etc. And now countries want to come to Saudi Arabia to negotiate. Whoever is going to come from Europe or Japan or others to negotiate with Saudi Arabia, they are negotiating and oil is in the back of their brain. Although the Saudis are isolating the events from oil, but the right. other side is, I don't want to anger them because I don't want this, this, this to happen. I don't want this to happen. So the other side always injecting that politics uh, into it. You don't see that in the boardrooms when you talk about the private sector. Right. Okay. So there is a price there. And if you look at what Biden told Netanyahu uh, the other day, what he told him, he told him, don't bomb oil facilities. Why? Because he does not want oil prices to go up before the election. So right. they inserted politics, although the other side of the world has nothing to do with it. Yeah, and I think that's one of the one of the concerns I've had is that. So I had this crazy idea, and I don't know what you're going to think about it because part of what you your, your presentation was three weeks ago touched on that, which is why I started listening very carefully to it, and it made me reach out to you. Is that so? We shut we started shutting wells in all over the globe during COVID. So we had all these wells producing, U.S., globally. And really, we had a pullback of a large amount of consumption and demand because everybody went home eating Cheetos on the couch and put masks on and the economy shut down. We used every storage facility across the globe, tankers, storage, South Africa, you name it. We own a tank company in Oklahoma. People were calling us to rent our brand new tanks to hold oil. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. You can't be that desperate. But they were. And I kept saying... To me, what happened to that oil that we stored all during that six or 12 months that was in excess of demand because the wells kept producing, what happened to it? Now, my, my conclusion was, and I'm probably wrong, but my conclusion was we have dripped that back into the market starting in late 21 through 2023. We dripped that excess supply back in the market. It was already accounted for. It was in storage. We just put it into the system, which means we had excess supply beyond the daily counting of how many barrels of oil and MCF and gas we had. So we kind of had a, an excess supply that was kind of a ghost supply nobody calculated for. It. That was my opinion. Today, I can't get my head around why we keep seeing this drop to $65 a barrel, yet we're seeing global demand go up because I'm not seeing an increase in Saudi. I mean, I know we have the Tanzania oil. I know we have some different producers, but it sure seems like we have a higher drag up on demand that supply is not keeping up with. But for some reason, I can't get my head around what's causing this continual drag backwards. We, uh, two days ago, we published a report. And today in the Daily Energy Report, we focus on this idea again. And we answered this question specifically. So for those who are interested, uh, you can go to our Substack and, and read about the details. We provided all the data and all the charts. I'm sending everybody to your site. Don't worry. I'm going to say go, go sign up because this is I love this kind of data. Thank you. Uh, so if you look at the United States data, the EIA, and assuming it is correct, yes, uh, we, we've, been, we, we've seen increase in oil demand. And oil demand today, if you look at the five-year range, at the top of the five-year range. Yeah. And yet, oil prices were declining. And people, we, we get always from our clients and our readers questions like, okay, you showed us all those charts. Why oil prices are declining? So today and two days ago, basically, we published those two different reports uh, showing the following. We, in, uh, today in the Daily Energy Report, the chart that is public, by the way, if you don't want to subscribe, you can just see it on Twitter. The issue here that people did not notice, and including analysts, that if you go back and look at the forecast of the EIA of U.S. oil demand. Mm -hmm. So yes, U.S. oil demand been increasing, but the forecast of the AIA is way, way higher by about a half million barrels a day that did not exist. Okay. 
and then we produced according to this outlook. Yes. So we brought in the oil, but there is no demand, mm. despite the increase in demand. And it's the same story for China, the same story for India. It is not there. So the projection was higher than the reality, and we've overproduced, but it's still much lower than the projection. Correct. So the idea here is the reason why prices are declining because we've been producing according to the product or to the projections, but the projections did not materialize on the demand mm. side. And yeah. you can see it in those reports. Basically, the whole all the charts basically show that. That's number one. If you go back to India and China, we do have. Uh, other problems uh, and the problem I've been repeating this on so many shows so I hope some people will not get re get angry at me repeating it again no, go uh, for it. this is an election year yeah. in the United States it's been an election year in India and between Biden and Modi of course Biden before the change yeah we've seen some media sources that are supporters of both and probably they got paid too because they spent a lot of money on the on the media anyway. But for the first time in history, instead of seeing advertisements or some people to have talking points, for the first time we are seeing journalists taking a real story from the market and tilting it to praise either Biden or Modi. Hmm. This never happened before. Hmm. We collected all those stories from the beginning of the year and it's just amazing. There and, and you can see who, who got paid. Yeah. For these things. Data in the oil market deteriorated since 2017. After the increase in shell production, etc., we have serious problems. So data started deteriorating, and then we have COVID and the data deteriorated more. Then we have the Russian invasion of Ukraine and all the gray fleets and all the ghost ships, etc. So it's deteriorated more. So data been deteriorating substantially. And all of a sudden now the media is distorting the pictures and they got everyone confused. So mm. between the data, having bad data on one side and having bad information from the media, we ended up with so many problems. I'm going to mention an example just to show the audience how bad the situation is. The media, when they talk about Biden, certain media outlets, they want to show that the sanctions on Russia are working. And the price cap is working. And for Modi, basically, they want to show this massive growth, economic growth in India, and everything is so rosy in India. At the same time, they want to show Modi that, oh, he's standing up to Putin too. He's our friend. So he's standing up to Putin. So they showed that uh, 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 India refused to receive 14 shipments of oil from India. All of them, BLCCs, which are the largest tankers in the world, were two shipments. And what the media right. told us, or certain media outlet, they said, look, they refused to take it because of the uh, price cap on, on uh, Russian oil. It's above 60, and they refused to take it. And look at Moody, how, you know, he's a friend of the West, etc. And then on the other side, they showed how successful the Biden uh, administration's policies and the sanctions, etc. Right. That's a complete distortion of reality. The whole story is in 2020, an Indian company signed a contract to buy that crude from a Russian company at certain prices, etc., etc. Later on, after the sanctions, when the Russian prices dropped substantially, now we have two prices. The contract prices are is very high, and the market price, the spot price, is very low. And the Indians went to the Russians and said, look, you know, there are two prices here. So let's re renegotiate the 2020 agreement and bring it down to the market. And the Russians refused. Yeah. And the Indians said, well, what the heck? I'm not going to receive those shipments. They are too expensive. Mm. Okay. So they got stuck at sea. But what the media told us, it was about the sanctions. It was about the price cap. But it wasn't. So what the Indians did, at the same time, the media was feeding us this information. The Indians basically bought an equivalent amount from other types of crude at a cheaper price from the spot market. Yeah. So India's import did not even change. But the media kept telling us the story, oh, they, 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 they refused to take the shipment. 
So that's, that's one part. The other part was the following month, the media start telling us about the recovery of the Chinese economy and how their oil imports is going through the roof because the economy is recovering. And we told them in our reports, basically, we told our clients and readers, said, be careful from this because the Chinese just grabbed those 14 tankers that have been stuck at sea at discount and it went to storage. It's not a reflection of anything. Yeah, right. So at the same oil, the same tankers, we got so many stories out of them. All of them are fake. Yeah. And I think I think that's the problem is I think the reliability of data is so poor that the, for somebody like me who's been tracking this for 40 years, I keep telling my partners, if A plus B equals C or one plus two equals three, that was normalized up until about five or six years ago. Now, A plus B doesn't even equal an alphabet. It equals a, an obstacle. I said, I, I, I'm finding discourse and economic push-pulls I haven't seen before. So it's making a lot of sense. So we're almost at the end of an hour, and I definitely would like to have a second opportunity to come back with you because I think this is just phenomenal conversations if we can get you back on again. But I'd like to ask one, one final wrap-up question, and this is going to be important. So when you think about the current economy in the US, the politics, the hurdles, the regulations have been pretty much anti-fossil fuel for the last four years under this administration. Um, do you think the US producers can maintain this level of production output and expiration unless they start getting debt, if they can't find outside capital, or do you think they're gonna get squeezed because it's higher cost of expiration margins are thinner, or do you think they're gonna be in a position to maintain the activity and maintain this 13 plus million barrel a day output. What are your thoughts on that as a wrap up question? Uh, generally speaking, we have to distinguish between two groups of investors and operators. As yeah. you know, those who started in shale in the early days, they were the real people. Yeah. When others who are not in the oil business, so those people making a lot of money, they jumped on the wagon, but they have no background in oil at all. And right. Most of those basically give the oil industry a bad name. Yep. I get oil that. investors a bad name. Yep. Uh, so we have to distinguish between between those two groups. I think if you look at the industry itself on its own, it went through different phases in the last 140 years, and they were squeezed financially several times and they survived. So this is not a big deal. We do have enough money from the private equity. We do have enough money from foreign investors. We do have enough money from the cash flow. The prices stay at the current level or higher. So this is not a big deal for us at this stage. Uh, the, do we have enough resources? Yes, we do have enough. I'm talking about the oil reserves, the gas reserves. We do have them. And therefore, we have, we, we always talk about multiple peaks of shale. Yeah. It's the idea, yes, shale might peak this year, but don't write it off because given the right circumstances, it's going to increase production in yeah. the future. I so this is not going to be the final, the final peak, but we might end up with a peak this year. Uh, just because of the mergers and acquisitions, because we keep repeating this point that it's not about discipline. The, the lack of activities or the lack of increase in drilling and completion activities has nothing to do with discipline at this stage. And it has nothing to do with lack of resources or lack of capital. It is the companies still being busy with mergers and acquisitions. They want to finish them. Uh, and then you are going to see an uptick in almost in everything. Yeah, I think and, I agree. I think I think I agree with you on that. I, I think that what we're seeing now is just that that kind of merger re reevaluation of what the it's a new hierarchy. When Exxon buys Pioneer, they double in size. They got to now restructure the hierarchy, their personnel, their staffing. But you know, from our standpoint, we're, we're we have tons of minerals, and we're seeing activation permits. It's exploded, which tells me they're loading up to start really drilling pretty actively the next twenty four to thirty six months. And I think that's partially because they believe there will be a new administration that might deregulate some of those restrictive fossil fuel regulations that gives them better access to cheaper capital. I think that's what's going on. But who, who the heck knows? I mean, I've, I've given up trying to outthink the market because I'm not that smart. But um, I would tell you this. Um, I, I'm Again, I, I say this. I'm very honored to have you on. I've, I've been well, incredibly thank you. Thank you. impressed with following you. And I'd love to have you back a second time. And from all of our partners out there, we just appreciate somebody kind of explaining a more macro global environment. But you know, you're here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. I'd love to have time to have you come by and, and take you to lunch. But in the meantime, I just want to say, uh, Dr. Alhaji, I, I'm just grateful for your knowledge and information and very uh, respectful of your time. So thank you thank for you. joining us. And, and I hope you have a great week. And I'll uh, follow up with you for another second opportunity here in the next 30 or 40 days. 
All right. Thank you. Have a great day. Yeah, you too. Have a good day, sir. Thank you so much.